welcome to another episode of Recovery Daily Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Miller. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and stroke survivor. And today I wanted to talk about the colors of recovery. <laughs> Actually, I was in my morning meeting and in the literature it mentioned something about the different phases of our lives and what color that brings to mind. So I thought, oh, that sounds like a fun exercise, so I'm going to do it. So uh, so the title of this episode is Life's Palette, Navigating the Colors of Recovery. But I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning and talk about what colors come to mind in different phases of my life and why. And it seemed like, you know, kind of a fun little activity for us today. So, um, man, like, it's every color of the rainbow. Um, looking back, you know, all the way from the, from the beginning. And, um, and sometimes it's in just one day, I will go from one end of the spectrum to the other. Um, another thing that was brought up this morning is this idea of a spiritual spectrum. And this is something that has come up like three times this week, this word spectrum. There's spiritual spectrum. There is the color spectrum of uh, like what, what we see when we look back through our life. And then what also came up this week in my research was the spectrum of um, of vestibular disorders. So the spectrum, it's something I must need to talk about. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, and the spiritual spectrum just reminded me very much this morning about these ebbs and flows that I've been encountering lately, especially this week in my recovery. So that really struck a chord with me. And um, the highs and the lows and uh, very much stuck in that idea of how one day I can be just down in the dumps and then the next day I can feel very full of optimism and hope. And so it's just, it's just an entire spectrum of emotions, um, constantly. And I like to, you know, a lot of people say things like this are a roller coaster and I just, roller coaster doesn't even begin to describe what it feels like to me. I don't like comparing it to a roller coaster. It's just, um, even though it's like, you know, there's one minute I'm, I'm just glowing with optimism. The next minute I'm just crashing into uncertainty and questioning the very essence of what it is that I'm doing. The one thing that I feel like I haven't actually questioned is this podcast. I, I understand the importance of this podcast in my recovery and um, continuing to recover out loud like I was talking about yesterday. So I think that that's positive, just that I've had that kind of confidence in what I'm doing here because it's important to me to have some sort of core or foundation um, that I know is working, that I know I need to do. It's something that I can always come back to. It's like in meditation, what do they call that when they're saying, um, you know, pick something that you can focus on, something like pick the area where you feel your breath the most, whether it's at the entrance of your nostrils, whether it's in your chest, whether it's in your abdomen, like pick a place where you feel it the strongest and uh, center on that, like call that, that is your home or your focal point, the place that you're going to come back to. So 
when you're trying to meditate uh, or just like clear your mind and breathe and just focus on breathing, your mind drifts and you think about like, oh, I got to do this tomorrow. I got to, why did I do that yesterday? That kind of thing. And so picking this point of return where that you can come back to and feel centered again is important. And that's what this podcast is to me. It's a place that I can always return to and feel at home and centered and not question anything. Um, If I'm sitting here in front of my microphone and I'm talking, I know that I'm doing the right thing. There was a point in my life, actually I still do it, where, um, and some of my friends on Facebook might remember this, that whenever the clock would strike 1111, I would post it on Facebook because it, for some reason, signaled to me that I was in the right place at the right time. Like, everything was just as it should be if I saw 1111 on the clock. Something I, you know, created in my head, but I also read a little bit about it. Well, still to this day, it seems like When I'm at a place of significance in my life, I look at the clock and it says 11-11. And so that's what I feel like. I feel like when I'm sitting here in front of the microphone and I'm running my mouth, that's what I feel. I feel like it's 11-11, you know, that I'm right, right where I need to be. So, um, so let's try this. Um, Think about it while you're listening to about the different, uh, colors to different phases in our lives. So uh, I already thought ahead so that I wouldn't be fumbling with my words too much. But when I think about all the way back to childhood, the color that I think of is a vibrant, vibrant primary green. And that is because it was a time of growth and nourishment in my life. I just feel like I was so loved and just growing. It was um, a very nurturing time in my life. I feel like I was getting everything that I needed in my life. There was never a time that I didn't feel safe, that I didn't feel loved. Um, I had a really wonderful childhood. And um, so green was what came to mind for me. Middle school is when this color green started shifting over to more of a blue. So getting a little darker, um, not completely a, a somber blue, but, but getting a little bit darker, you know, getting to be a little more like um, life was being introduced, you know. I had to start making decisions, and some decisions were bad, but things weren't um, so much in my hands. You know, I had doubts and insecurities. I guess that's more uh, what it was like. And and then as I moved, and mind you, this is about when I started drinking, was in middle school. And so then in high school, the color that comes to mind is even darker. It's more of like a navy blue, even into like a brown. And for me, this is um, this is where my inadi- my feelings of inadequacy were really um, really stood out to me the that I felt like I wasn't good enough um you know I even started to get into this area where I felt like I wasn't smart enough and that was because of people around me that that I uh allowed to influence me so in middle school it this blue color was um you know, I still felt like I was growing, you know, I felt like I was still becoming the person that, um, that I wanted to be. And I started getting noticed for being really good at math. So I was 
put into advanced math classes and and that was really something that um, was very rewarding to me and that continued on through high school where I was getting into advanced math classes. I also was flourishing a lot in writing and English and um, I still to this day talk to my English teachers, coincidentally, um, from high school. And um, I don't know if they listened to this. That would be cool if they did. But hi, sorry for my grammar errors. <laughs> anyway, um, and yes, I was waving to the mic just then. <laughs> um, so high school, I s continued to feel like I was special. Um, and I think it's important to feel special. And um, what sucks is as I continue to get older, that feeling of being special started to dissipate. Um, and a lot of that for me was um, bullying. I was bullied a bit in high school. It started in middle school. There was um, a young woman, particularly, that would bully me in middle school, and um, she made fun of me. She made fun of me for how I looked. Um, it was really mean. It was really mean. And in high school, I was also bullied. I was made fun of by some gentlemen, some young idiots. And, um, and they were mean to me. They would talk about my body and, um, and it wasn't nice and it made me feel really stupid and ugly. And, um, it invited these ideas to me that I wasn't good enough. I wasn't like all the other beautiful, um, friends of mine because they didn't get made fun of, you know, but for some reason I was, and I, I don't know why that is. It's really unfortunate. Um, there was a point where these gentlemen were even, um, calling my house and cussing at my mom. And, um, and I think we ended up like turning them in or something like that at the high school. I can't remember exactly, but um, it's the kind of stuff that you hear about in, um, in the news and, and in, you know, social media when we're, when we're really pushing for no bullying in schools and stuff. That's the stuff that I got. You know, I was bullied like that. It was really, it was really bad. Um, and, you know, no wonder this color, uh, this color that I think of when I think of that time in my life was dark and getting darker. And during this time, my drinking was also increasing. Um, now, of course, I couldn't get alcohol as easily in high school. Um, but when I would go to a party, there's, there's a, I don't know if I've talked about this or not recently even, but forgive me if I have, but when I was a freshman in high school, my, um, I went to a party. I feel like I just talked about this, but I don't know if it was because I was preparing for this episode or not, but, um, I went to a party and I was a freshman and the party was at a, another freshman's house and she was uh, beautiful and smart and had a boyfriend and was friends with all the popular people. She was all popular and stuff. And I was friends with her too, but I was never good friends with these people. They were all really good friends with each other and I was just on the outside. You know, that's what I felt like. I was just on the outside. And still today, when I happen to see them, like one every other every decade or so, I still feel that way. I still feel like I'm just on the outside, and um and and 
anyway, I, I went to this party and it was probably the first big party that I went to. And I drove there with a friend. I think I had a friend with me. Um, and I got drunk and was planning on driving home. And my brother was there who was a senior while I was a freshman. And he was so angry with me. Um, and he ended up driving me home, thankfully. But, um, this, you know, these were all signs when I was growing up of my inability to manage my alcohol, I guess. And, and my, uh, signs that there was stuff wrong. And then there were things that were being created within me due to my environment and the people around me. And it's just, uh, it's so hard to grow up. It really is. It's hard to be an adult, but it's, I feel like it's just so hard to find your way as you're growing up. Um, and so this time in my life just kept getting darker and darker in my eyes. Um, when I went to college, this I would say was really the darkest time, um, the darkest color for me. Um, I felt very alone there. And I remember my first, I remember when it was like my first night staying there after, you know, my, my mom had dropped me off. And I think my mom and my sister, I can't really remember, but, and I remember walking down and sitting on a hill and watching a lacrosse game from the hill. And I remember feeling so freaking empty inside. Like I, I wasn't excited to be there. Um, I was just, I felt so lost in the world. Um, and soon enough, I, I met a bunch of people who like to drink and that felt the best. That was the best feeling I could conjure up in myself was drunkenness. And so I tried to feel that way as much as I possibly could. And I was doing really well in school until I was doing even better at drinking. And then the school stuff came second to that. To that. Um, so that's where my, I feel, I feel like the alcoholism really took root. Um, the parties became just a haven for excessive drinking. And, um, I, I just kept seeking places to, you know, dark places to hide on the inside, um, you know, hiding in the shadows. That's what I felt like. I was hiding in the shadows within me. And maybe that's why I always call it my dark place, because that's what it felt like. It just, when I think of these colors, like, and, and I, th and I think about that cartoon thing that I was talking about yesterday, it really was just darkness that was filling inside of me. Um, and they, I would say that after college, like, I don't even know how much more I can say about college. It, it really was just a drunken, just mess for me. Um, when I think back, like, I don't have any desire to go back and visit my college. It, it, maybe it would be healthy for me to do that. Um, because I have so many like nightmares that I, I, I don't know, nightmare. I don't wake up screaming, but I have bad dreams about college and like, I don't remember graduating. So I have dreams that I didn't graduate. Um, I have all kinds of dreams about, um, being in the dorms or being in the library or walking around campus and stuff. Maybe it would be healthy for me to go back, but um, I don't really have a desire to. 
because it just feels icky to me. And then post-college, I think that when I met the kids, my kid's father, that's when I started to see the colors started getting brighter again because I started have feeling like I wasn't alone. Like I really had this partner in life. And when I had um, my kids, that is when um, there was just a rainbow of colors that, that emerged in my life. And they've always, and they've been there ever since, this rainbow. Because life never was dark again after I had my kids. There, you know, like, even at my lowest low of drinking, if my kid w were to walk in the room, it was like a bright light was walking in the room, you know, um, if that makes sense. And so being a parent just illuminated my life into a rainbow of colors, yet I wasn't quite able to under, I, I wasn't able to manage all of those colors. I wasn't able to face them all and understand, I didn't know what to do with them, but they were there nonetheless. And it was when I entered into sobriety that the true spectrum of colors became very clear to me and every color became manageable and and I was able to navigate each color and that is like a testament to the strength that I um, that I gathered in my sobriety program so uh what sobriety has also taught me, and I've mentioned this a couple times, is that sobriety taught me that no matter how dark it is during the, you know, like we had rain all day today outside and um, the sun is still shining somewhere on the other side of all of those clouds. There's a, there's a guy in my meeting in the morning who always says this um, on dark cloudy rainy days he'll say remember that the sun is shining on the other side of all of that so we just have to wait it out and um, and that is very reminiscent of um, what I call my higher power and it and it's also it also reminds me of like what I went through this week that even though I was feeling very, um, you know, I was experiencing dark colors this week, there were still bright colors that um, were waiting for me after I got through it. I just had to figure out how to manage it and get through it. The only way to it is through it. So I had to navigate all of that and choose, you know, choose happiness, choose self-education, choose knowledge, choose the, the things that are going to help me strengthen rather than pulling the covers back over my head. And um, when I've been, you know, I've been thinking or I've been starting to write this this book and I, I've been thinking a lot about the importance of sharing experiences and, and the self-help thing and, um, and how I think I talked about yesterday, maybe I, I don't know, you know, I have to apologize because like I practiced my episode this morning, which is something I've never done. And so now I'm like, was that this morning or was that what I talked about yesterday? I, so I'm a little bit of a mess. That's hilarious. Anyway, um, so I had been thinking about, because my dad brought this up when we were talking about me writing a book. And he said that um, what better way to, to 
write a book than to share about experiences as opposed to these self-help books where these educated people um, write a book and tell you how to help yourself. And, and when I was thinking about this morning in relation to that, I was like, yeah, like a self-help book is like trying to define a word using the root of the word. It doesn't make any sense. Like, I need to help myself, so I'm going to tell you what you need to do. Um, Like, yeah, that's fine. Give me advice. Of course. Of course. We, you know, I, I love advice. But the best way I think that I can learn is from somebody else experiencing something and telling me what worked for them rather than somebody saying, try this and this might work. (laughs) You know what I mean? Instead, somebody telling me I did, I actually tried that and it didn't work. Uh, So don't do that, you know? So, um, anyway, uh, I, I, I'm just thinking about all of this in, in embracing this whole idea of a spiritual spectrum, um, the colors of our lives. And, um, and then of course, uh, this, this spectrum of, of, uh, discomfort and, and, deficits and things that I'm dealing with as far as my recovery goes. So, um, I, I think really the focus here is to embrace the, the spectrums of life, of spirituality, and use the tools that, um, that I've gathered in sobriety and uh, stroke recovery to face each color, every shade of every color, with the strength and support that I've cultivated in the journey. But I haven't just built it myself. I've All of this is from watching others. All of it. I haven't come up with it. None of this is unique to me. It's all because I've continued to listen to other people in sobriety and in stroke recovery, and I'm gathering it all up, and I'm trying things out. I'm hearing, you know, this worked for me. This didn't work for me. And so I'm trying it, and then I'm sifting it out. I'm sifting it out and telling you, um, this is what I learned from other people. This is what worked for me. So here. Um, you know, here's, here's what I've got for you. So I think that's really the best way that we can help each other in the community. And, um, so whatever shade I think, and whatever color that I'm dealing with today, I have to remember that that is going to change. The colors are always changing constantly. Even in one hour, I can feel, you know, I can feel so many different colors. And I, as long as I know that, that, that when I'm sitting in some dark color, being able to see that it's not always going to be dark. That's what's the most important thing in my recovery. And it's so hard to see that. I think I was talking about that yesterday, that it's just so freaking difficult when we're feeling bad to to believe that that's going to dissipate and, you know, that the clouds are going to go away the rain is going to stop and the sun is going to come out. You know, tomorrow the sun is supposed to come out. And it's really hard to believe that today. I've got half of my Christmas decorations up. I could only do half of them because my head started hurting um, outside. 
And so I've got all the rest of them sitting on the ground and they're just getting wet. And I'm like, oh, this is a mess. This is never going to go up. And but I am assured by these experts in the uh, weather arena that it's going to be sunny tomorrow. So um, so I'm just going to um, I'm just going to wait for that to happen. You know, um, sometimes I think the best thing that I can do when when things are um, dark is is to just pause and and just let time process that you know um some i don't always have to be fighting um i can just kind of relax and and pause and and let let emotions, I think, work themselves through me. I think that's important too. So um, anyway, so that's what I've got for you today. So um, so we'll keep uh, dealing and um, taking one color at a time in our lives. So thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.